I'm flow. I love aviation so much, people start to call me airflow. Today I'm at uh, American Heritage Museum for the World War I aviation weekend. You're just very special today. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm the ambulance driver. <laughs> oh, okay. Could you tell me about it? Yeah, the, you have a 1916 ambulance. It's a 4T. And it's, it's an original, been, been restored. And we take it out to schools and do demonstrations at schools and that. So it's, it's a, and we drive it on parades. And then she's just over there on the right. So. But uh, it was actually the, the American uh, Ambulance Service was made up of volunteers uh, back in, in 1916, uh, 14, 15. They went over there before the, you know, during the First World War and uh, they paid their own way and uh, they stayed there for the entirety of the war. So that was, and then of course the Ambulance Service started from that, from that point. Nice. Is this your own clothes? This is, this is my perfect. own. Perfect. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> They're repros, but yeah, it's all my own. Nice. Thank you. You're welcome. Enjoy the day. You too. Uh, my name is Dante. Here today to see uh, the planes flying and everything. And the reason I'm just like this is because I love history and I love to show history. Oh, yes, these are mine. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> Where did you find them? Uh, I found that I found most of these flea markets, Amazon, and military sur surplus stores, things like that. Yes, uh, this is my favorite thing in the world. It's okay, my, sure. it's my, uh, well, it's not really any real gun, it's just a toy rifle, but it does the job. It can move like that doesn't fire anything but uh yeah it's just an overall great thing got it from a military surplus store and it's pretty good does the job Are you also yes. thank you you're welcome my name is davis kenyon i'm a volunteer with the american heritage museum uh what i'm course i'm currently wearing is the basic uniform of the united states army in world war one particularly the American Expeditionary Force in France in 1917-1918. Everything on here is mostly reproduction, though my, the web belt itself, that's actually original. Original? Yes. Uh, we're here with, I'm here with the 22nd, Inf uh, no, 26th Infantry Division Living History Group, which is a group of reenactors, represents the local National Guard units from New England which did fight in World War I between 1917 and 1918. They're actually the first American unit to fight in, who land in France in 1917. And they took up positions in the, was it the Asson sector in April 1918. They wouldn't be the first American troops to see combat. That belongs to the first division, however. But they would fight in all the major battles of the First World War that the U.S. was involved with from Chateau Tracy, Saint, uh, Second Battle of the Marne, Saint Michiel, and the Meuse Argonne Offensive. Well, actually, you want to look behind right there? Oh, tell me out. I was about to say, I definitely want to miss that. <laughs> okay. And conveniently gets put in the background too. That's a perfect Sorry. <laughs> it's also an American uh, painted aircraft for the American Expeditionary Force, so this is an American aircraft too. Though it's technically French, but not related. <laughs> and um, what's what's your bag? Like, um, oh, this. Well, this on the bag here, well, this is my gas mask bag. So, unfortunately, obviously, one of the big things about World War I is that chemical warfare was widespread and widely 
used on particularly the Western Front. So we had the first widespread issue of gas masks by pretty much all the major military powers involved in the First World War. America, though late to the party, definitely still followed the doctrine of many nations such as that. Gas, though, I should say, was a very rare uh, casually inflicting uh, weapon system. Arguably, some would say it was the one weapon that killed the least in World War I, but it had massive casualties in regards to health dis dis uh, disabilities. You breathe it, it can really hurt, hurt your lungs. It caused very severe burns, long-lasting health effects that would affect many veterans and civilians alike that unfortunately were caught in a crossfire long after the end of the First World War. But obviously you'd wear this in the event of a gas attack, so that way you would at least be able to breathe and ideally fight under such combat conditions. So I don't think the latter option would be very likely considering how incumbent these are and hard to wear. Is that a regional test? No, it's not. It's a, re okay. it's, it's a reproduction. Thank you. Yeah, now they're filling this plane. Just, uh, it's such a unique place, the uh, Heritage Museum, from the cars to all the tanks and the airplanes. So it's just a great place. It's, it's, it's one of a kind, really, in the whole country. So, uh, yeah, it's just very nice to be able to come out here, especially on this great weather. You're a pilot. <laughs> yeah. Do you fly? Um, I just retired from the airlines, and I was in the Air Force for about nine years. Yep. And uh, good, good time. <laughs> I'm a student pilot. Oh, are you? Yeah. Oh, where do you fly out of? I fly Champs, um, Gyro, okay. and Trike. Oh, nice. Yeah. What airport do you fly out of? Is it a uh, grass field somewhere? Or? Yes, it's near here, Crow Island. Okay. And also I base here in Beverly Airport. Sure, yeah. I'm just not very far from Beverly at all. Oh, I used really? to fly some light airplanes from there, too. Okay. Um, you know where Sterling Airport is? Yes. Yeah, I'm in the uh, soaring club there. Oh, yeah. Have you done that before? I really want to. You do got that. to. It's the. Really it is the coolest that. thing. We have a. The SSA has a program. Soaring Society of America has a program, where they'll get you a flight. You get a log book and instruction and all that, and you can do all that online. And then you just show up at the field. Uh, it's best to try to call somebody because we usually fly. Uh, so we're going to like get today with this this weather. They're definitely fly. out there. It was kind of a so decision me between here, going here I and going there. But uh, an yeah, runway, you gotta you gotta go try it because it's not that far away. Can see this uh, clearly from these vantage points. Now just cleared the airfield and the, the World, One, uh, World War I airplane is going to fly for performance. And I saw the pilot already put uh, his suit on. Nate, uh, from Rhinebeck, if you're around, come on over here, please. So now the pilot is in the airplane and uh, testing the elevator, aileron. So next up we have the SPAD-7, which is a... So cool. I mean, in both ways. Because now I'm sitting right behind the airplane. When the propan uh, propeller running, engine running, the brace <laughs> is on me. So it's very cool. And this plane is awesome. It's cool. Biplane. Here 
his bag over the airfield. Flies quietly and beautifully. Very talented pilot. More flights, so probably around noon, we'll have So now I'm running to the pilot. Uh, first of all, please a round of applause to Mark. Good. Thank you so much for old Rhinebeck Aerodrome to bring this wonderful SPAD 7 out here and I just can't emphasize enough of what a great trip it is just a almost three hour drive out there to, uh, to visit them and see their events uh, well worth the time. Hello Mark. Today, yeah I'm uh, my name is Mark Mondello I'm from the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome so, Rob, in uh, upstate New York and this is a 1916 we'll SPAD 7 replica it's part of our museum we'll collection and uh, we flew it down here we'll to Stowe for this wonderful tomorrow. event that the Collings Foundation's putting on. Uh, we're happy to participate and fly the SPAD some, and we're having a great time out here. How long have you been flying? I got my pilot's license in 2015, so uh, about seven years now, and I've been flying at Old Rhinebeck pretty much that whole time. I specialize in the antique airplanes like this, and that's what I think is the most fun and challenging, and, and that's, that's sort of my aviation journey is all antique airplanes. I fly behind a lot of engines that are 100 years old or more, and um, that can be nerve-wracking sometimes. They take a lot of maintenance to keep running well, but uh, I'm also the aircraft mechanic, so I have faith in my own work, so to speak. But uh, yeah, old airplanes, they're not like modern airplanes with all these safety features and computers and all these things to help you. This doesn't even have an electrical system at all, no radios or anything like that. And uh, it's very elemental, seat, seat of your pants flying. You feel the wind, and if it's pushing you more on one cheek than the other, you know you need coordination or something like that. And you're getting lifted up or down in the seat, feeling the forces of gravity and flight. That's how you know you're flying the airplane. It has very bare bones instrumentation or anything like that. So it's really all visceral. I know I might be getting close to a stall if it gets very quiet, so I'm using my ears all the time, and it, you're just using all your senses. They're all engaged in flying, and that's one of the things I love about antique airplanes so much. This, this airplane is an extremely authentic replica. It does have a few modern features like brakes, because we take it to away shows, um, but like the Newport, that's like 99% authentic. This is probably about 75% authentic, um, but it still flies just like a 1916 SPAD did back in 1916. You can glide, but it does not glide very well. It's pretty much drop your hat out of the airplane and that's where you have to land. But you don't lose control or anything like that. If the engine quits, you just have to land now. <laughs> yeah. Doing the wing overs. Yes. What kind of speed were you actually at? I'll enter a wing over about 100 miles an hour and, and finish it about 55 miles an hour. So it loses a lot of energy going up like that. It's very draggy. You see all these bracing wires and struts they needed that to have a strong airplane in 1916. This is a very strong airplane for its time period, but all that adds significant drag that really robs energy from the airplane when you're doing maneuvers. You really can't see directly ahead of me. Uh, so to see the runway when you're landing, you have to put the airplane sideways so I can see the runway. And that also helps me come down a little faster because it is a relatively short field we're landing in here. For maintenance wise, you know, this airplane predates the idea of a maintenance manual. 
you know, they, they didn't have instructions on how to change engine cylinders or fix wing spars or anything like that. They were working just off the knowledge that they had as the aircraft builders in 1916. So when I go to address a maintenance concern, I'm really starting from scratch. And we have to follow the FAA guidelines and whatnot that exist for modern airplanes. And uh, that can be challenging sometimes with stuff that predates the concept of, of you know, standardized maintenance. So uh, what I like about that is everything's a unique challenge. Whenever something goes wrong on the airplane and I need to fix it, I have to kind of invent a procedure and, and write down what I've done and do research and, and try to find out people who have flown them in tandem in the past and listen to these stories. People like Mikkel Carlson, who uh, have poured their lives work in airplanes like these. We all work together and um, communicate amongst each other. And, and really that's the fun part for me. It's kind of like maintenance archeology span in a way. Uh, and I, I find that very entertaining. So um, generally an airplane like this to build probably take 10,000 hours or more of labor. Um, it's quite a lot. There's a million parts, none of it's standardized. You can't buy anything at Napa, you know, there's no, no part like that on it. So um, this one was built by Carl Swanson. Uh, it was his very last airplane. He built over 25 World War I airplanes um, from about 1960 to when he passed away in 1999. So, uh, he was a pr very prolific builder, and by the time he built this one, his last one, he was pretty good at it. <laughs> yeah, the nice thing about this, it's, it's wood, fabric, and some steel tube. So if you can weld, and you use a wood plane, and you can sew, sew with a sewing needle, those are all the skills you need to build this airframe. Down wires are called landing wires, and they're really just to hold the wings and everything stiff uh, and while you're on the ground and landing. So they're not as important as the flying wires, which keep you up in the air. That's also they're doubled in case your enemy shoots a wire away. You have a second wire. Yeah, they did that with the control cables as well. All the controls are actuated, well, most of them are actuated by cables. Um, so if one cable was shot, there's a second cable as a backup. I flew from Hudson Valley of New York to here. It's pretty much a straight shot. There's a couple larger airports like Worcester and the, the um, air base there and whatnot. Uh, which I had to avoid, you know, because they have controlled airspace and I don't have a radio, so I can't talk to them or anything. So I kind of had, I had a map, it's called a sectional, it's an aviation map, I have it in my lap. And I just kind of, I'm like, that's that town and that's that town and I know where I am, yeah. And so that engine, um, it, yeah, it's sort of underpowered for the airplane too, compared to an antique engine, because an antique engine has a, like a 10 foot diameter wooden propeller moves an incredible amount of air and really helps you take off. This Lycoming has the same amount of horsepower, but a much smaller propeller. So while the airplane can go just as fast once it's up and flying, it doesn't accelerate as well, so it doesn't take off as well. So to get the best takeoff performance out of it, we need to use the metal prop. Um, the, you could put a wooden propeller on that engine, it just doesn't quite have the takeoff performance. T is the personal insignia of the pilot who flew this in the Lafayette Escadrille, um, George Tuner, and uh, the Indian Brave head was their squadron insignia. So this paint scheme comes right as the Lafayette Escadrille was becoming an actual American squadron. Uh, so it's sort of an in-between paint scheme. And so he, he flew airplane number 11, and the bottle cap with the T was his personal symbol, and then the squadron symbol was the Indian Brave. Yes. where they're just flat. They have no dihedral, and that is partially to increase the...